Commonwealth Medical College. As I hope all of you know, TCMC is one of the nation's newest medical schools. We're a community-based medical school focused on improving the health of people of Northeastern Pennsylvania. You are standing in our wonderful new building here in Scranton. We were very fortunate as a new school to uh, be welcomed by Lackawanna College and their president, Dr. Ray Angeli, to their campus, and that's where our charter class began their studies. But this year we'll be in full swing with first and second year medical students on this campus. Our third year medical students are now out doing their clinical rotations throughout Northeastern and North Central Pennsylvania. Today you're going to see a wide variety of facilities that are used to accomplish our education, our research, and our service mission. And I look forward to answering any questions that you have at the end. My colleagues who will introduce themselves in a moment will be taking you through. I do want to point out Mr. James Ryan, who was instrumental in getting this building started, and he and his staff continue to make sure we're up and working well every day. As you go through our halls today, you're going to see some of our medical students, but you're also going to see some of our REACH High students. REACH <coughs> High is a program that currently has both high school and college students in a program helping them learn about health professions and medicine. We also have Marywood uh, physician assistant students here uh, doing some of their physiology and anatomy studies. We look forward to answering your questions, showing what we're doing. Um, I think you'll be very excited by what you see and very excited about what we're going to be able to accomplish for the community and the health of this community with this building. Let me turn it over to Jim. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Ryan. I'm the uh, Chief Public Safety and uh, Facility Officer here at the college. And uh, thank Dr. North for those kind of words. But again, it was a team effort. Uh, a lot of my staff and a lot of the construction managers and local architects that were employed throughout. And over 170 different local tradesmen worked on the building at any given time. Uh, uh, quickly, I'll just mention a few facts so that we can actually see the building because it's much better to see than to talk about. It. Uh, it's a 185,000 square foot building. We started in February of 09, kind of a quick schedule, but uh, as you can see, we're about 98% complete. We are doing some tweaks and some uh, little changes here and there as the population moves into the building. Uh, we started off with a sustainable design, a green building, if you will, and we hope later this year to attain a LEED certification. We won't know until we get that, but we hope we, we can hit the gold or the silver, somewhere in that area. A couple quick LEED items, you'll see that the granite, that's on the lower level here is a local product. The uh, limestone product up above the granite is also local, and that's one of the, the key factors with LEED certification. They don't want us traveling 2,000 miles to get product. Within 500 miles is the goal. We use stormwater, rainwater for uh, our toilet rooms, and we also use it for the cooling tower. So we recycle uh, almost 90% of any rainwater that gets here. During the construction process, we actually recycle 82% of the construction waste. The industry norm is 50%, so we're very proud that 82% you know, of the stuff that was waste didn't go into a landfill. It uh, actually got recycled. And again, we basically have an east wing and a west wing and connecting two-story link. Uh, I, like I said, I'd rather let you see the building. Any questions throughout, stop me, ask me. With that, Dr. Maurice Clifton. I'm Maurice Clifton, I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, so uh, I'm part of the curriculum and, and things like that. I'm going to do most of my talking on the tour as we go through and talk about what we do during, um, in the different spaces, but, but I think what we, what we really try and do is have an innovative, active curriculum where, where students are learning by doing rather than sitting and listening to, to lectures, so we'll kind of show you how that happens. So we'll start you doing as well, if you want to. Correct. I'll leave it to her. My name is Brian Campbell. I'm the Chief Institutional Advancement Officer, and we will have Dr. Noor available at the end of the tour to answer any questions. Any thank you for Dr. Noor before we see her at the end. Thank you, Dr. Noor. Great. So these are our, our patient encounter rooms. So basically, the patients can be here in, in a gown. Uh, the students can come in this door uh, and, and uh, see the patient. So they take the history, they do the physical exam. Uh, once they're done, then they leave, they can go out that same door, they um, write a note on what they, what they encountered, and then um, while they're doing that, 
the standardized patient is on the computer and they have a checklist. And everything from, did they ask me about my abdominal pain? When did it start? You know, what the, what the character is? To, did they examine my abdomen correctly? Did they examine my heart as well? Um, to interpersonal skills. Did they use big long words or did they speak in a way that I could understand? So uh, it's, it's a way that we can capture what they what was going on in the room real easily and then compare it across different times. The, wa the washing of the hands is a big deal too. I'm shocked at the number of doctors that don't wash their hands at the encounters, which is the biggest problem with hospital-borne infections. So that's one of the rubrics, right? Right, that so that could be sure. one of the checklist items. Did they, did they wash their hands? So sometimes it's it's amazing. Does something? What is it? That once a doctor gets over forty, he or she just like can't be retrained. You know, you're over forty, so I presume you're in that category. That that, that it's just now is the time to really to get that right. to really drive home the procedural part of the encounter. There, and there's a hidden camera up there. See the little right. dome. And uh, it, it, uh, so there's one up there, and then there's one here. So if the if the student's standing this way, um, you can get them talking to the patient like from, from that camera, but if they're examining the patient like this, then you can get it from that camera. So there's a control room that can control which, which version we're, we're looking at. Any questions about this room? students are, are in that control room as well? No, we'll show you where Yeah, we're heading there now. That's right a good question. Room. And what year you are in medical school? Come on in, guys. We can move all the way down, I guess. We're going to have a real-life scenario here. Is everybody in? Everybody in? Yeah. Okay, let's start with the introductions. My name is Megan Gooch. I'm from Einan, Pennsylvania, and I'm a second year medical student. My name is Mike Farrell. I'm from Pomfret, Maryland, and I'm a second year medical student. My name is Dan Benio. I'm from Drums. Uh, I'm a second year medical student. Uh, my name is Kevin Baker. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, and I'm a second year medical student. <clears throat> what are we going to do today? Uh, we're simulating a cardiac arrest, and our students are going to try to revive our patient. And this is Tony. Hi. She's in charge. <laughs> the guy behind the door. The guy. <laughs> He's the <laughs> Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you, you want to explain? So you're going to send this patient into cardiac arrest? Is that That's correct? correct. Okay. All right. Set to go, man. All right, it looks like he's in V-fib, so let's start chest compressions. Two breaths. Get the pads ready, just in case we have to shock him. Shocking. Clear? Clear. Shocking. EKG. So looks like he's in BFIB. BFIB, so let's administer uh, some epinephrine during uh, chest compressions. Pushing one milligram of epinephrine. Stop chest compressions. He's still in deep fit. Let's administer Clear. another shot. Clear. Stop. He's still in deep fit. Let's administer uh, amiodarone. Administering 50 milligrams of amiodarone. Another shock. Right, clear. Shocking. Right. Let's 
good. All right, looks like it's sabling. <laughs> I have no idea what you just did, but it was very impressive. <laughs> Tony, I mean, what do you want to you want to just evaluate <laughs> here? What, how is that a, is that a typical? No, they scenario? did a good job. Uh, after we get a rhythm change, we'll check for pulse and some vital signs, and uh, we'll see how our patient's doing. Where's our attending, Doctor Tracy, or is he on the golf course? <laughs> I think he's on the golf course. Oh, okay, gotcha. Good job. I, I, I just ask if we just talked about this a minute ago. It, you've been on codes before, Maurice. At what point does it, does a code get called? I mean, what, how many minutes into something when you've tried this and it's not successful? Does someone generally make a call? It, it really depends on the situation and, and, and the patient and what is going on. Um, uh, you know, that's kind of an individual patient's decision, and usually, hopefully, physicians have conversations with their their patients about what their wishes are. Um, young people, so you know, little kids with it are drowning victims can go a long time, you know, and and can still be revived and and have real good outcomes. Um, young people with PEs, you know, you can do this for a long time and, and actually still have real good results. So it depends on the situation. Did you guys have a history on yeah. this before you started? Did you know, does this guy have a history that they know about before mm -hmm. they start? Normally we would. Yeah. Uh, we'd be given, uh, you know, in this you case walked you on, you know, you started work today, it's 2 p.m. You know, everything is given to us to make it a full real life situation. Uh, presently, no. Okay. <laughs> but it kind of depends, because sometimes in real life, you don't have, you know, the story. Um, or maybe there's a, a chart over someplace that you have to find and, you know, interpret at the same time that you're trying to revive. I think a lot of the time, too, like, you're, you're communicating with the other health professionals, like the EMTs and things like that, so they kind of fill you in on the route to the hospital. So when they show up coding, um, you know, it's not just like they were dropped on your doorstep. How do you decide amongst yourselves? You each had a role. Did you discuss that beforehand, or were yes. you told by your... <laughs> we discussed it okay. beforehand. It's, it's really good to make a plan of action. Usually it happens very quickly, so it's like you do compressions, you push the drugs, you do a mess for the shock. Okay. Any other questions? We've we got to get going, but I do want to take just a second and have somebody explain Noel. Tony, do you want to explain Noel real quick? <laughs> sure, if you look over here at Noel. Noel is actually our birthing simulator. And um, she does exactly Thanks, that. She gives birth. There's a, a handful of different presentations we could program into her, and uh, it just helps the med students get more familiar with the birthing process and the complications that can come with it. Now, Tony, can you communicate on the other side of the mirror here through her? I mean, can't you? Doesn't she we speak? We can communicate with the sim men from the other side. A sim man, okay. Yes. So you can up, say, you're killing me, it hurts. They're, they're set up to have full-blown communication, yes. Noelle is not. Okay. And the baby, is the baby over there? The baby is, yep. That's a wireless baby, which can be taken out in the parking lot or to the baseball field and also sent into cardiac arrest. And you have to do what they just did at a baseball stadium, for instance. I've been told that every doctor at some point in their life, someone will rush up and hand them a baby and say, my baby's not breathing. And you have to, and you're not generally in a setting like this, so you have to be able to sometimes adapt. And that's just as important as knowing in the clinical setting. I'm, calm, I'm way above my pay grade now. Yeah, you're way above. <laughs> We're focused on diseases that are relevant to patients in northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, the residents of Northeastern PA are an aging society. 17% of the residents in Northeastern PA are over the age of 65, whereas 13% nationally are. And the average age of a citizen in Northeastern PA is 41, whereas it's 35 in the rest of the country. So we see a number of chronic diseases related to aging, such as diseases that affect bone, bladder, or learning and memory. And some of our researchers are focused on these topics. We also see very high rates of cancer in Northeastern PA. In fact, colon cancer is about 25% above the national average. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer are also high. And a recent report from the uh, Northeastern Regional Cancer Institute and Sam Lesko and his colleagues showed that there was a striking increase in the number of cancers associated with smoking. This includes esophageal cancer and bladder cancer. And we do see higher rates historically of smoking in Northeastern PA. So our researchers are focused on diagnosing and understanding the progression of diseases associated with cancer and chronic diseases of aging. In this lab, we've got uh, researchers focusing on learning and memory, and they're assessing molecules in the brain that can impact uh, mental health as well as 
um, the ability uh, to affect cognition. And we also have a lab here that's associated with understanding immune deficiency and how in, in an aging population, sometimes people have depressed immune systems and they don't respond to pathogens such as a fungus or bacteria the way a younger person might. And so they're looking for new ways to treat that disease. So one of the, the outcomes of this is that we hope that our basic scientists will interface with clinicians in the region and have teams. And what we want to do is have our basic scientists learning from clinicians about what they see as the clinically relevant problems. And then also having our folks bring back new ideas in terms of better ways to diagnose disease, predict outcomes to therapy, and perhaps even to treat diseases in a new way. A billion dollars a year leaves the region in clinical care because patients have uh, an inability to access certain standards of care. And one of those standards of care is clinical trials. Whenever a patient fails to respond to a therapy, then they go out and they, they need to access a clinical trial to have a new way to address their problem. We hope that when our basic scientists can inter interact with clinicians, that we can develop a clinical trials infrastructure in the region. And 10 years down the road, what I hope you'll see are these multidisciplinary teams of clinicians, um, community-based researchers, and basic scientists all working together to look for new ways to treat and diagnose disease. And at the end of the day, all any patient wants is the best care possible, as close to home as possible. And so we hope we can bring some of that infrastructure in the region. Along with this, I expect to see an economic development impact. Um, research can impact uh, the recruitment of new companies to the region, and we would love to see a biotech community develop in Northeastern PA. Um, <clears throat> somewhere down the road, I hope that you'll see companies coming to the region to access our excess uh, capacity or infrastructure, and that we could collaborate and work with those. And this is important for diversifying the economy in Northeastern PA. So we're focused on research efforts that can interface with the clinical mission and help us to bring new care options to the region and also to have an economic development impact. 24 of these rooms throughout the building, 25, is that correct, Maurice? Yeah. 25. 25, all right. Come on, anybody else coming in? Is anybody else coming in? So let's go. All right, go ahead, Maurice. I'm scared to now. Um, so, <laughs> so when I went to medical school, we had lectures. You know, it was like eight hours a day of just sitting in the lecture hall. I'd wake up and realize that, you know, at that moment I was the only one that was awake. And then, you know, I'd go to sleep and somebody else would wake up. And, um, so what we try and do now is really make it a lot more active. So we have them read. We have video um, podcasts of lectures that they can watch in their own time. And then they come into small groups and they attack problems. So they either have a patient case or some sort of scenario that they work through and then actually use the knowledge that they've been reading about to sort of make it practical. Um, there's you know, lots of whiteboards, as you can see. There's smart boards. They can get real creative. They can, uh, they can hook up their laptops. Each student has a laptop. So they can hook up to the smart board and, and show their you know, friends, a drawing that they, that they designed, um, they can, you know, record things on the board and then copy it down and then share it with their, their colleagues. So really try and work on working together as a group. Physicians in general aren't as good at working together as we would like, and so we're trying to start, you know, this early as well as other things. Um, and uh, so far it's working really well. How many of you do that this many types of coughs? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, we told a funny story the last girl mentioned it here, too. Uh, we mentioned the boards earlier. I'd like to make sure those of you who don't know, our, we t our students took their uh, first board scores last week. And you want to share the good news? They, 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 yeah, they took about um, a month or so ago. Um, our pass rate was over 98%. The national average is probably going to be around, well, last year it was 92%. Um, so, so we feel really good about that. So we, we had the Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a guy named Dr. Avila, in here for a tour. And this is back in May. And we just barged in like we did there, and there was a young woman who's literally from Pittston named Jennifer Sidari. And she was in here with her headphones on listening to a podcast. And she turned around, and there was 10 of us, including the Secretary of Health, <laughs> there. And we were like, oh, hey, we're just here visiting. And she was in here studying for it. So, so we use these small groups, but students also, I think, like these because they're very nice rooms, and they can be used for, for study. We love to spread out all their stuff. Yeah, all their stuff, and, and they know, can do yeah. podcasts and stuff. Any questions about the teaching team room? Oh, there is one other quick joke I'll tell. That, uh, these are originally called small group rooms. What's that? <laughs> I'll tell it. 
And uh, so I'm do, I do fundraising for the school, right? So I knew that we were going to try to sell them these for, to people. And I said, how are you going to sell them the word small in it? So we changed it to teaching team room from small group room. Because it's really a teaching team. And there are 25 of it's these. It's 25. Yeah. Yes. The classroom is identical to the lecture hall that you saw next door. Uh, except in this case, we happen to have our two regional campuses uh, connected by a video conference technology. So you're looking at Abby in Williamsport. Abby, can you say hello? Hello, everybody. And uh, Connie is in our Wilkes on our Wilkesbury campus in a teaching space there. So Connie? Hello, how are you? So um, video conference technology exists not only within our lecture hall spaces, it also exists within some of our smaller classrooms up on the third floor, in the auditorium of course downstairs that you, you may have seen, and in general is available even via laptop throughout any of the teaching rooms and teaching spaces within the college and it allows us to have students or some combination of students and faculty in any one of our three locations. So the presenting space can be on any one of our three campuses and students can be on any one of our three campuses. For the third year of the MD program, in fact, this is being used every Friday for their Friday didactic lectures, uh, where students, uh, as you may have heard, are split between our three campuses, but the presentation might be coming from any one of those three campuses on a Friday. So it allows us to sort of leverage faculty and bring the expert from wherever they are to the students wherever they are. Uh, this system also allows us to, to bring in content from literally any other similarly equipped video conference site in the world. So it's not just our campuses, but we could have guest speakers from other universities or other places in the world for that matter. Um, Complementing that is sort of the students' uh, technology. So students are, all of our students are equipped with laptops all of our programs. Every inch of all of our spaces at TCMC are wireless equipped, so students can literally sit in a stairwell if they wanted to and have connectivity. Uh, the vast majority of our teaching materials, supplemental materials, our library as you'll see, are available online through our portal system. So students don't literally have to be in a specific geographic space in order to take advantage of the technology or to access their course materials or even to participate in an instructional setting within, within the college. So uh, again, the environment was created with the idea that students are going to be mobile, they're going to be in clinical settings, they're going to be on our campuses and beyond, and they need to have access wherever they, they are. Uh, we also take advantage of a lot of clinical faculty and physicians who are in the region, and again, we want to be able to tie them into the educational experience wherever they may be on our campuses, or in some cases beyond from hospital settings and other locations throughout, throughout the, the region. So with that said, I think we're going to move. Any questions for any questions. Here's what we're going to do. We're a little bit behind. So does anybody, what's it called, B-roll? Does anybody need B-roll the library, or do you have enough B-roll? We're going we're to talk outside the library. If you want to go in the library and get B-roll to help yourself, we'll just get you to rejoin us on the fourth floor. So I hope you've had a good time seeing some of this remarkable building and some of what we're doing in education and research and service. I'm joined by some of my colleagues, our medical students who are currently working in research laboratories as well as working with some of our um, visiting <coughs> students in the anatomy lab and also one of our students who is doing a clinical research project this afternoon. I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Our students are available for your questions as well. I have questions. Please. Um, for students or some of the members here. I guess the, the learning process, because now it's so digital. It's so different from before, from years ago. You don't have to be there to be able to get your lecture. To, you, know, you can just tie in wherever you are. You could be you know, on a trip and you could watch your lecture. How different, I mean, how different is that? I mean, obviously it's working, but it's so different now. Do you think, I, I guess for you, Dr from before to compare to now, how is it learning-wise? It's very different, but I will tell you that what I believe medical education has very importantly, and we do extraordinarily well, is high-tech coupled with high-touch. Because you're right, you can get your lecture any place. One of the most important things for our students to learn is how to learn, because 
probably 80% of what I learned in medicine is now obsolete. And we need them to be lifelong learners and able to continually learn and technology is part of that. But high touch is part of medicine as well. And that's the communication skills, the relationships with the patients. That's using some of the technology so that our students are learning those skills. It's using our standardized patients so they're learning to communicate before they're actually there with patients. But one thing the TCMC does is our students are out with patients and physicians right from the very first year and that's integrated. So it's technology in service of growing physicians who will be able to very readily through technology but also through communication and through the art of medicine be able to care for patients. Would you guys like to add anything to that? Um, well, one thing with the technology that's really nice, uh, just how classes approach differently. You know, it's great that we can replay lectures over and over again. It's also people learn at different speeds. So if it's a topic you're more familiar with, you might want to pick up the pace a little bit on what's going on. If, you, if it's brand new to you, you might need to hear it every word just a little bit slower so you make sure you got it. Uh, and that's great. And then, like Dr. Nora was saying, we use it right away. So. The last two months of our first year, we were thrown together into small groups where we were given cases. And uh, these were very real life situations that everything we learned from that week and prior weeks, uh, we could call upon. And it was a good way to make sure, to give us the chance to learn and then to make sure we actually really had nailed everything home. I did have a question for the students. Could you take us through the experience of going into those exam rooms? with the uh, standardized patients for the first time? Was it unnerving? How did that go? It's a very unique experience. Um, you're very nervous the first time, and you're, you're trying to think like, oh, I hope I remember all the questions I have to ask. You have like all these things in your head you're trying to remember, so it, it's, a, it's unique. It's kind of awkward at first, but by our last patient, we're like, okay, we got this. And it, I think it's a very good experience because when we went out on our community weeks in the community, it wasn't awkward to talk to real patients. So we were more comfortable for our first time encounter with a real patient. What were patient. some of the problems that you encountered in those rooms? I, I think it's, um, you know, you kind of have the jitters going into it. Um, um, silly things like your mannerisms, you start to notice because, again, technology comes into it. They record our... Um, Do you have to watch it then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, you, you have the opportunity to see what you've done right, what you've done wrong, and improve upon that for the next time. So, um, you know, it's a little unnerving to watch yourself and, and see yourself maybe mess up or, um, you know, just be a little bit nervous in the situation, but I think ultimately it's helped all of us in the How long run. How many times do you do that before you actually approach a real person, a real patient? Is it just the 12 times? Or is it more than one? It, we have uh, three community weeks, and they're spaced out throughout the year. And we have standardized patients usually before the community weeks, so it's generally one to two standardized patients before each community. And each step, they actually ease us into it. So the first time we were working with standardized patients, we were given 20 minutes to do something, to ask the series of questions that by the end of the time, we were taking less than a minute to do. Uh, you know, like you get used to knowing how to approach questions and how to word them. So you can be a little bit more direct. Um, and then when we went out to the community weeks, the first time you really just observed, the second week you went out there, you were told to really interact with the patients. And then the third week, it was we had to do a full history and physical on some lucky patient. <laughs> so. Well, and when we say lucky patients, we recognize whether it's Dr. Jerry Tracy, who's one of our regional deans, or my group of medical students, or our youngest colleagues, we're here to serve the patients. Our patients actually are our greatest teachers. But what this generation has that we did not is that we're preparing them better. Really, we've learned from the airline industry in large part. We are preparing them with standardized patients and with simulations before they're going out. And in that way, they will continue to learn from patients, but they're also adding to the patient care and being an important part of the relationship with the doctor. Jerry? They uh, actually, the question was that I believe the total is 13 patients they do histories and physicals on before third year uh, under the old system. Your first one was third year, 
uh, and that was very unnerving. So they, they, they have over 13 under the belt. Right. And the other thing is full, and then there are other experiences that they'll have with standardized patients and simulations as well. Other questions? We are so delighted that you're here to see the building. It is a wonderful building and we take great pride in it. But the building is a means to the end, which is improving the health of this area, um, helping grow great doctors for the region and our country and to serve our community through our education, research and service missions. We hope that as you have questions, not only about Commonwealth, but as you have questions about health-related issues that come up in other stories that you're doing or the like. If you need an expert, if you're trying to get hold of someone, we hope that you will view us as a resource so that we can put you in touch with one of our over 700 community-based clinical faculty that are so important to this medical school as well. Thank you so much for being here.